they were rid of the skinny shoe altogether. Yeah, um, it's over here. My presentation's over there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, shall we, shall we start? Yes, I, I think I'm ready. You can start. We're ready, okay. Well, good afternoon to the South Mahir Office representatives, the Gauteng chapter members who are with us on this webinar, our esteemed panelists. Thank you very much for taking out your time uh, out of your busy schedules to be with us. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much as most if not all of us uh, in the property and the FM industry are aware of the POPI Act or POPIA, uh, which for this webinar we'll call the Act, was assigned into law in 2013 and was meant to be in effect around about 2018, maybe 2019. We, but what we know that despite the delays, the Act will be enforced from uh, July 2021 and the SAFMA Houting chapter with the support of the board, SAFMA board, deemed it proper to host this workshop to ensure that our members at the very least are informed, educated and aware of the requirements and the obligations set out in the Act. At SAFMA, we encourage proactive preparation, checklisting and to ensure that compliance is not a burden but something that's easy to do. To this end, we have uh, asked, uh, we worked with Amish and Jody from Fairbridges, Whiteham and Becker uh, at Tennis or FWB to present a brief overview and industry specific summary of the act, which we trust will give us a quick and an easy to follow guide on the act. Jody, who will be presenting is a director at Fairbridges Wartama Beck Attorneys and has a practice for a number of years as an attorney. She holds several qualifications um, and she's got a great interest in the, in, the, in the act and she has contributed significantly to the administration of uh, the properties property portfolio and uh, general to commercial operations going forward. Um, thank you to all the members who submitted written questions prior to the webinar and know that they will be covered in the presentation. For any new questions, please type them on the Q&A section of the webinar and uh, Jody will respond to same at the end of her presentation. And should we be unable to get to your questions, we will um, re send written responses to all the attendees as soon as possible. Jody, trust that you're ready. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm going to just share the screen and just put the share the Poppy Act. Thank you. One moment, please. Thank you so very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the Poppy Act uh, was passed in 2013, and we've, it's, it's long awaited, seven years, and it's finally been implemented. And uh, it has great consequences, and uh, it's a great piece of legislation, and let us consider same. Right. It originates from Section 14 of the Constitution, and its main purpose is to ensure that all South African institutions remain and uh, in a responsible manner, act in a responsible manner when collecting, processing, storing personal information of entities and data subjects, uh, which are in essence individuals. Now, the Act, as Dumasani correctly says, actually becomes applicable from the 1st of July, 2021, and all entities have one year to comply with such act. Now, personal information comprises of any type of information relating to an individual. 
and in a property facility management industries uh, specialization and area, what would that pertain to? So a person such as Tom's identity number, it could be his um, telephone number, his car vehicle registration number, it could be CCTV camera surveillance within the building, uh, such as personal information. Now, it's very important to understand the difference between an operator and a responsible party. What is a responsible party? A responsible party determines the purpose and the means, okay, for controlling and processing such information. Whereas an operator is a person who processes information, all right, in terms of a contract or mandate without coming under the direct uh, process of uh, actually processing the personal information. It's very important at this point, I think I'd like to point out to all of you that even though an operator actually enters into some sort of service level agreement with the responsible party, okay, um, to assist with uh, processing information, they, I would suggest that the operator enters into a further agreement with the responsible party to undertake to keep such information uh, confidential as the act unfortunately at present doesn't make provision for same. And um, what would one consider to understand the term processing to mean? It's any action you can think of in terms of a verb. Anything that you can do with information would be processing. Now, before we consider pertinent definitions, I'd like to put forward a scenario. Let us consider Tom. Tom wants to gain entry uh, into the property facility management industry's premises. And in order for him to do so, he needs to share some of his personal information um, to basically uh, gain access into uh, the entity's premises. So one needs to consider what is the entity's purpose in collecting such information from Tom? And how much information does the entity want to collect from Tom? And what security safeguard measures is the entity going to implement in order to safeguard Tom's personal information? And what type, when I talk about what type of personal information uh, the entity wants to collect from Tom, there's a difference between the information. There's special information, personal information, and then there's personal information. And that's when these pertinent definitions become applicable. Let us give some analysis to say, what is biometrics? Biometrics is a technique of personal identification. For example, retinal scanning, fingerprints, voice recognition. Let us go on to the next definition, consent. What is consent? Voluntary, specific, informed expression of will. Okay, in which a data subject gives permission for the processing of such information. And what is a data subject? It's a person to whom such personal information relates. And electronic communication basically comprises of any text, voice, sound image that's transmitted, okay, over an electronic communications network. As I've alluded to above, processing is any operational activity, any verb you can think of, the collection, receipt, recording, organization, collation of information. And a record, to keep a record is exceptionally important, regardless of its form. And writing on any material can comprise of such a record, which must be in the possession of a responsible party. Okay? And information produced, recorded, or stored can be uh, stored on a computer, a tape recorder, and that obviously can form part of the record. As I've touched briefly on special personal information, and it actually is dealt with in terms of section 26 of the Act, and examples of such special information would be biometric information, trade union membership, race or ethnic origin, health or sex life of an individual. And very important, section 27 of the Act stipulates the prohibition of processing special information unless 
one obtains the consent of the data subject. Now, let us consider the eight conditions associated with processing personal information. What are these? Number one, accountability. So, in our example with Tom, the entity must be upfront with Tom as to the reason they would like to collect such personal information from Tom. The processing and limitation is the second condition. And they must be upfront, the entity again must be upfront, upfront with the way in which, the manner in which they're going to process such information of Tom. The purpose specification is the third condition. And they must provide reasons to Tom as to why they wish to collect such information from Tom. For example, it could be to prevent criminals from gaining access into their premises. And the next condition, further processing limitation, there could be a proviso there that if they actually identify that Tom is a criminal, they will further process that information by reporting same to SAPS, South African Police Services. The entity must also, uh, inf information quality is another condition uh, of lawful processing. And here the entity must ensure that they've obtained the correct information from the data subject. The next condition, openness, the entity must be quite clear with the purpose uh, and the means by which they are obtaining such information from the data subject, Tom. Security safeguards is the next condition. And here the entity must uh, upfront, be upfront with, the, with Tom and tell Tom the safety guard, safeguard measures that they've implemented to prevent Tom's information from being hacked. Lastly, data subject participation. The entity um, must uh, allow Tom to give his uh, information voluntary. And if Tom objects, that is the end of the story. Um, Tom doesn't gain access into the premises. And furthermore, if Tom would like to actually report uh, the entity, they must provide, the entity must provide Tom with the information of the information regulator, contact details. Thank you. Let us now move on to the person considerations for the provisional and facility management industry. So the first person consideration is how does the property and facility management industry deal with the data subject Tom when they're trying to collect verify information uh, prior to him gaining access into the building? What, what must they do? What uh, measures and means must they put in place? Now, Section 18 uh, of the Act deals with notification, and it's very, very specific. Now, the way we would suggest you go about it is you would record uh, all of the notification requirements uh, in, in electronic form on an iPad. And you could present same to Tom prior to Tom uh, gaining access into the premises in which the following requirements would stipulate as would be stipulated as follows okay um, the information being collected okay so what would the uh, what would such entity require uh, identity number of tom car vehicle registration number of tom i always go by the rule less is more so the less information you collect the better for the entity but identity number name car vehicle registration. Secondly, the name and address of your entity. Thirdly, the purpose for which the information is being collected. In this particular instance, you do, you, you do not want criminals to enter your premises. Whether or not the supply of information by that subject, by that data subject is mandatory. So is Tom giving his, are you allowing Tom to give his information freely? The consequence of, not allow, of Tom not allowing uh, his personal information to be collected by the entity. Is there any particular law authorizing or requiring Tom to provide his information? Any further information such as where is the process, where is the information being sent to? And furthermore, 
providing Tom with the right to lodge a complaint to the information regulator. Now, very important, and we've delved a bit into the definition of consent. It needs to be informed, it needs to be free, and consent goes hand in hand uh, with notification. And, the, and Tom should actually have to electronically provide his signature on the iPad after um, reading this notification. And one of the grounds of processing information is consent, and that is the ground which I'm going to be dealing with throughout the seminar. Now, very important, the responsible party in this instance, being the entity, bears the burden of proof that the data subject has given his consent uh, to utilize his personal information and to process that. Now, furthermore, on such notification, the Tom um, must be notified of the security measures that um, the entity intends to put in place to protect his personal information. Furthermore, just before we get to this consideration, and it's not in the slides, um, it, it must also advise Tom, you know, um, of how long uh, they, the entity um, intends to retain uh, Tom's information for. Now let us go on to the next consideration. Visitor verification such as Tom's can be collected from a variety of sources, um, such as the credit bureau, such as the licensing department. And so do we have an obligation as the entity to notify the data subject um, of such verification? And here we would be collecting information directly from Tom, which is in terms of section 12 of the act. And one would need to consider who is the responsible party. Um, and once we've answered that question, uh, we can give uh, further guidance to further guidance to this question, to this answer, actually, I should say. So, us as the entity would be a joint responsible party with the licensing department. Um, we would both jointly be processing Tom's uh, personal information. And so the questions one needs to consider is, again, what database is this information being cross-checked? Are electronic uh, sources uh, being intercepted subject to a computer? And very important, what security measures has the entity being the responsible party put in place to prevent Tom's personal information from being hacked? And again, we also have to consider how long uh, verification of the information is being retained for. Very importantly, Section 19 of the Act deals with the requir requirements pertaining to implementing security safeguard measures. And one of these requirements is to identify all reasonably foreseeable internal and external risks uh, uh, in doing these checks. And my advice to you would be to employ an outside security expert to assist you to comply with implementing such security safeguard measures. Moving on to our next consideration. Law enforcement agencies use civilian technology to trace wanted persons, wanted vehicles. And in this respect, do we have to notify data subjects um, of such checks? Now, criminal behavior forms part of special personal uh, information, and that's contained, as we've discussed before, in terms of Section 26 of the Act. Now, a responsible party in conjunction with others determines the, me the means and the purpose for processing such personal information. So the questions one would need to ask is, does a property manager carry out these verification checks um, are they carrying out these checks on behalf of third parties? Now, if we're not, as the property manager, carrying out these checks on behalf of third parties, then my advice would be that we do not need uh, the consent from the information regulator, and we may do so, but we would need to notify uh, Tom of same, uh, of, of such uh, notification, uh, and the same would, be need, same would need to be included on the electronic uh, notification on the iPad, and one would need to get Tom's consent to say, and also that is consent in writing on the iPad. However, if we act on behalf of third parties, right, 
in checking um, and using, utilizing such civilian technology, then we would need to uh, obtain the consent of the information regulator in terms of section 57.1 of the Act. And um, the question uh, basically, uh, the con this consideration just goes on from the last consideration in which it basically says, this civic duty Right, is it not in violation of any laws and should you include it on the iPad not notification to visitors? And I believe I've answered that question. It should uh, be part and parcel of notification on the iPad. The next consideration is the legal obligations of landlords. So a lot of uh, you know, sensitive information is obviously exchanged between the tenant, contractor, and you know, there is this concern that they may share this information with unauthorized people. And so, how, what advice should we give the, uh, the entity in protecting such information? Now, the first question one needs to ask is, are we the operator or are we the responsible party? Okay, so if we are the operator, we have obviously entered into some sort of service level agreement with the responsible party to assist with processing such information. And my advice again would be that another contract would need to be concluded between operator and responsible party, which could be in the form of a non-disclosure agreement in which the operator undertakes to keep such information um, in terms of the initial SLA agreement confidential and should the operator or its employees breach such agreement, the responsible party would have the means and mode uh, to go after the operating uh, operator. As I've mentioned previously, um, there is a bit of a gap in the act with regards to holding the operator uh, liable uh, for breaching confidentiality. Now, if we are responsible for taking decisions over the rental agreements, as well as processing the information, we would have to ensure uh, that all employees, right, of our company would have to sign non-disclosure non agreements um, to keep all information confidential. And we would have to put disciplinary measures in place uh, to deal with the employees who breach such agreements. And very importantly, we would have to uh, implement staff training uh, to uh, cause awareness of the act. Another question posed uh, with regards to confidentiality is does the confidentiality clause as a standard clause in most contracts relate to the authorized signatory to the contract as well as to their staff and subcontractors? And obviously it's dependent on the wording of such signatory. Um, yes, but it would apply to the authorized signatory. And in addition, one must obtain proper consent from all the employees um, to keep confidential all information that they become privy to. Now, uh, we are in the middle of a national state of disaster and COVID-19 regulations call for the entity to collect health and other sensitive information uh, from data subjects uh, entering the entity's premises. And should we obtain the consent from Tom uh, prior to him entering the entity? And so my answer would be as follows. A balance should be struck between the right to privacy and the right to protect the public against harm from COVID-19. Now, Tom should be notified of this on the electronic iPad. However, when uh, such information is collected to detect, contain and prevent COVID-19, consent is not required from Tom. And, and this has been specifically mentioned by the information regulator, advocate Pansy Klaku, in her guidance note. Now, a current subject uh, that took place last month dealt with Experian, who's a consumer credit reporting company, who declared approximately the 19th of August 2020 that it experienced a breach of data which exposed approximately 24 million South Africans and almost 800,000 entities. And the South African's information regulator says it received information from a whistleblower that such information had be, been shared on the dark web, okay, which is unfortunately an illegal 
uh, web that basically sells stolen personal information in exchange for monies. And such personal information comprised of cell phone numbers, uh, employment details, uh, identity numbers, and home numbers of individuals. And just another example uh, on an international level is obviously the Panama Papers that were leaked several years ago um, by a secretary and uh, the havoc that that caused as well. Now, the, any person convicted of an offense in terms of uh, the act could face uh, imprisonment of up to 10 years and a fine of up to 10 million rand. So the consequences are dire. And just to sum up what we have actually discussed, Tom entering uh, property facility management's industry needs to be notified of the following the information that the entity wishes to um, collect from him, the purpose for which such information is being collected, uh, the processing means of uh, processing Tom's uh, information, the security measures that have been implemented to safeguard Tom's uh, information. And at this point, I just want to deal with biometrics. I don't believe it's advisable to implement biometrics. Um, because this really is a, it, it's, it's identifying an individual, you know, with their DNA, in DNA form. And, but if you are going to use biometric information, it, you need to specifically obtain Tom's consent. And simultaneously with this notification, a privacy policy should be drafted by the entity. And we will deal with that in a moment. Um, what should be contained within such privacy policy, but one of the factors to be contained in such privacy policy at this point is uh, how long such entity intends to retain uh, Tom's information for. And uh, so I've basically summed up the notification to Tom uh, right now. And uh, the last, uh, one last fact I'll just refer to here is obviously giving Tom again the right to lodge a complaint to the information regulator if he, if he wishes to do so. Now, privacy policy. So the privacy policy should contain uh, the following factors. Number one, the duration of the time the entity intends to retain Tom's information um, subject to um, the business requirements. Also, Consideration needs to be given to the entity's insurance policy and whether, same whether such insurance policy dictates uh, how long uh, any information of the entity should be retained for. Now, an entity can either accept responsibility to protect data subjects or can insert a disclaimer that data subjects enter their premises at their own risk. But ultimately, an entity should consider accountability. Um, and how much responsibility an entity is prepared to take on obviously depends on such, on such information being collected by the entity. And in the privacy policy, there should be another proviso that the entity abides by all South African law, all South African legislation that prevents such information uh, being hacked, personal information being hacked uh, from the entity. Thank you very much. Um, any questions? Uh, Jody? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. There was a question from Kay. Um, will there be a database of all ID numbers, the identity? Uh, to identify whether the guest is a wanted person, etc. Okay, so there is a database. So it obviously, I think let's start at the, let's just start with the following. If we, as the entity, are, you know, we've notified the data subject that we're going to cross-check Tom's personal information um, prior to him in, gaining access into our premises to establish whether he's a wanted criminal or not. Um, then once we've established that, in, once we have established 
that Tom is a wanted criminal, um, then we have a right to actually report Tom uh, to the South African police services. So yes, of course, there is a database. And if we are, you know, utilizing such database um, to verify um, whether such person is a wanted criminal, um, we would obviously obtain, you know, such information. Does that answer the question? Uh, Jody, there is another question, um, and actually it's it's got two parts to it. The one talks yes. to mm -hmm. the sand roll traffic surveillance and e-tolling cameras which are used, uh, the toll booths, and I think on the national highways, as well as the VUMA cam matter. Um, on the second one, I know there was a recent court judgment, but it's, it spoke to the uh, the leeway, so the, the uh, permission to erect cameras and also the legal requirements for erecting, recording, monitoring um, people using the VUMA camps. So it's two questions actually. What does the POPI Act say specifically on traffic surveillance, e-toll surveillance, as well as the VUMA camps that are, are being put up in Johannesburg? Well, I believe we start off with traffic surveillance, you know, um, obviously that's um, uh, administered by the Minister of Transport. And um, it's, you know, for public safety, in the interest of protecting a purpose which is public safety and um, I think just from my previous example of COVID-19 regulations one needs to balance the difference between right to privacy against the right to uh, safety you know and preventing harm and without cameras uh, being placed uh, you know on the highways etc it, it would be doing a disservice uh, to society at large and in my view, it definitely is necessary to have such cameras um, on the highway uh, for protecting society at large, uh, protecting the operation at, at large. Uh, then to go on to uh, ETOL system, um, I believe there is still controversy about the ETOL system. At the moment, is, it is still in force. And if people are, you know, not paying their fines, et cetera, um, they are, um, they're not paying their fines. Uh, I don't think there is a, they're not being, the, there's no legal action being enforced at this time. I believe it has been suspended and um, there is still not finality on same as yet. Okay. And with regards to the VUMA as as, uh, as far as Poppy is concerned. Okay, it's fine. Then uh, the cameras that are being put up in Johannesburg, um, I know that there was a question of um, whether it's ethical to put up cameras without notifying people that they're being monitored and, 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 and surveilled. That is the first part. Secondly, if you live in the area where cameras are being put up, you would normally be notified. You may give some form of consent as a resident or homeowner in that particular area. But the visitors into the area, should they by law and as per papaya provisions, be notified that they will be um, monitored record it, and if needs be, the information may be given to authorities for investigation purposes, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the, the short answer to that is that they must be informed, okay, that these cameras are putting up, being put up throughout the neighborhood, and, and every resident must give their consent. And yet again, let's get to condition three. What is the purpose of putting up these, this surveillance? It's, okay. it's to protect the safety of, of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, all residents must notify and must give their consent in writing. And yes, if um, there is an unwanted vehicle that's seen in the, na in the neighborhood or criminals are detected by such uh, uh, cameras, it must be reported to the South African police services because that is the purpose, to prevent criminals from gaining access into the neighborhood. Okay. Um, another question. Uh, and, and sorry, just to sum up, Dumasani, and obviously the Poppy Act would allow it. Okay, it, so it does allow for that. All right. Thank you. That, 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 that's a does crucial proviso. Yes. Okay. Um, I think in light of the experience security breach, a lot of um, people are either getting emails, being offered something, or getting calls on their cell phones. Um, does the Poppy Act protect us uh, as yet, or should we wait for July 2021 before we can invoke its provisions with regards to our data being used by uh, marketing and, and, and financial institutions? So section 69 of Poppy Act, Poppy Act actually is applicable here and it deals with direct marketing. 
and it really is only comes into effect from the 1st of July 2021. But, you know, if you are contacted right now and you don't wish to speak to such a sales uh, marketer, then you can say, I, you know, I don't wish to speak with you or I don't give my consent um, for you sending me such emails. I, I, in the interim, have received such telephone calls and I very politely have, I, have say, you know, I don't wish to proceed with such telephone call. Thank you. Have a lovely day. Okay. But it will only come into effect uh, 1st July 2021. Okay. Um, when you go to uh, most buildings, you normally get a notification that the premises are monitored by a CCTV camera or something like Smiley on camera, but there's always a notification that the premises are monitored through um, closed circuit television. Now, the question is, does, do, do staff have to give consent um, to have their whereabouts recorded on the company's CCTV or not? It is preferable that... Uh staff uh, provide their consent absolutely okay. so if there has been staff that's been in the employ of such entity for a while now is the time to explain to them uh, that copia has been implemented implement staff awareness and obtain their consent and, okay. and and bring to the attention the purpose for which such surveillance has been implemented within the building okay. and there, thereafter obtain their consent all right. So, um, uh, Jody, this is actually a comment and a question. Um, yes. So, the front of house operations need to be aware of the act provisions, guidelines, and requirements, as well as your back of house operations. So, by for example, the security officers, your receptionists, they've got certain legal obligations towards staff and visitors into the building, as well as back of house people who, who may handle finance, leasing, and other documents that may contain people's information. Would you advise that such people should be trained on the Poppy Act, customize something that speaks to their area of responsibility or not? Absolutely. Staff training needs to be implemented. Uh, it needs to assist every single employee uh, within an entity. Okay. And they need to be educated of the on the consequences uh, of the Poppy Act. And... Uh, very, very important to keep all information confidential that they obtain uh, from data subjects. Okay, so I suppose things like, for example, if you sign a lease agreement as maybe says a surety or as the leaseholder, you would give people your domiciliar, you'd give them your ID numbers, maybe even a copy of your bank statements and what we call FICA documents. And an admin clerk yes. would have access to the same information. Right. So what you're saying is that yes. the signatory to the lease is held um, is expected to keep the information confidential. Similarly, Correct. all the staff members who might come across this information will have also will also have to adhere to the confidentiality of the lease agreements. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And, and just a proviso to that is that they should actually sign a non-disclosure agreement, given such oh. undertaking to keep such information confidential in addition to saying. Oh, okay, so so if you in one perhaps same can be made, perhaps provision can be made the same within such uh, staff's employment contracts. Okay, okay, that, that's going to be my follow-up question. Okay, um, the question is: uh, Will encryption of information be the new requirement in terms of storage of information? That's number one. Number two: How long do we have to store this information? So I came into your premises, I signed this visitors register, I consented that you can take my information. For how long must that information be stored? And okay, mm -hmm. and how and, and how would you, uh, or, or rather, how are you supposed to store information? That, that this is two questions in one. Okay, so let's start with the first question: encryption. Uh, so as I've alluded to, it's uh, safeguard measures. Okay, form part of uh, the conditions, okay, of processing personal information. So my suggestion would be, uh, depending on the size of the entity that you are, you consult an outside safety security expert to assist you with implementing necessary safeguard measures to protect uh, personal information of entities and persons. That would be my answer to the first question. So yes, encryption is uh, one way of safeguarding uh, personal information, uh, but you would need to be guided by a security expert. Then my second, uh, my answer to the second question posed would be that how long does one store information, personal information for? Depends on uh, entity's privacy policy. And my suggestion uh, earlier on in the presentation was that with 
uh, drafting notification uh, on an, and storing it on an electronic iPad, simultaneously one should draft, an entity should draft a privacy policy. And as we've discussed in uh, my presentation, the privacy policy should con contain factors such as the duration of time such information of an individual and entity will be retained for. And that is obviously subject to such entities uh, insurance policy, which may prescribe a longer time for such information to be retained for. Secondly, um, whether the entity will be held accountable if uh, such information is hacked or whether such entity wants to put a disclaimer within such privacy policy uh, advising that uh, anyone who premises enters at their own risk. I have in emphasized in my presentation that, you know, however you look at it, an entity needs to be held accountable if information gets hacked, specifically if we are the responsible party. We have a, a larger uh, responsibility on our shoulders. And then lastly, another factor one could consider putting into the privacy policy is that we abide by all South African legislation, okay, in safeguarding uh, personal information of data subjects and or entities from being hacked. Okay, Thank you, Joan. Sorry. All right, two, yes. two more questions. Uh, uh, I think the one you did touch on earlier, maybe just need to repeat. Um, the question is regarding the COVID-19 uh, requirements. I'm going to read it as it is written because I was trying to uh, fly through it. Fine. So, who is responsibility is it to ensure that um, staff members hand sanitize, have their temperature read, and they, sub they, they insert the, the, the details? Is it the person at reception, or is it the, uh, I think it's called the compliance um, uh, person within the organization? That's question one. Question two, what happens if staff mm -hmm. members don't give, don't consent to being recorded by CCTV cameras? Okay, so to, let, to answer the first question with regards to which person should take, a, you know, an employee's temperature, I think that needs to be dealt with internally within the organization and uh, perhaps uh, HR, uh, you know, could uh, provide advice in that respect. But uh, it needs to, uh, temperature obviously during COVID-19 times needs to be taken uh, and if positive, if such person tests positive, it obviously needs to be passed on to the authorities, although such person does not need to give consent. It, 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 it's, uh, they, it needs to be done anyhow. And then, right. uh, sorry, Dumasani, you said then the second question uh, with regards to CCTV cameras. If, I, if I'm employed um, in a comp company A and I refuse to, uh, to consent to being recorded by the cameras within the building, what happens? Well, you know, it's, it's a problem because why we need to go to condition three. What is the purpose of the entity here? The purpose of the entity is to implement security safeguard measures or to prevent criminals from entering the premises. And if, you know, you, this particular employee does not provide his consent, it's going to be difficult for such employee to, to work in the premises uh, and it, it's going to complicate the employment relationship and uh, perhaps we need to understand from this particular employee his objection and we need to uh, perhaps implement here it would be crucial perhaps he doesn't understand why we've implemented the CCTV okay. cameras and we need okay. to sit with this particular employee and implement staff training awareness of problem perhaps okay. that would assist all right. I have seen signage that says, kindly note, you are entering these premises, which are monitored 24-7. By entering these premises, you are accepting the terms and conditions uh, as applicable. So tacitly, you are giving consent by driving into the premises. The next question says, even if all the safety protocols were implemented, if a company gets hacked, is it incumbent on the company to contact all the people who visited the, their premises? Okay, so to start off by answering the first question, uh, as I've dealt with section 18 of a Poppy Act, it's in very important to notify every single individual that enters the premises that we're going to be obtaining their personal information. And we need to obtain their consent in writing, specifically if we are the, process, we are the responsible party, we bear a bigger burden. And 
if push comes to shove and their information is hacked, how are we going to prove as a responsible party that we obtained uh, such individuals' consent? The only way we'd be able to prove that is in writing. Okay, so thank you. So my suggestion would be yes. Okay, thank you, Joan. Again, sorry, somebody just asking for, please clarify the difference between an operator and a responsible party. So give an example, say, between a landlord and a security service provider or a facilities manager. So, it, so the landlord would be the responsible party, and then an operator is someone who is a contractor to the responsible party to okay. assist with pro, uh, to assist with the service uh, in assisting the landlord. Okay, got it. So, in other words, so for example, uh, facilities manager. Yeah. Okay. So I get. Okay, perfect. Understood, right? Um, Jody, I'm just going through the last batch of questions. I don't, okay, there's just one, there's actually two requests. Um, but we did, well, when we had our dry run, we, we, we did talk to this, that there will be a request for, um, yeah, sorry, just this quickly. We did note that there will be probably a request for a copy of the presentation. And you have consented that we, that we can share same with the attendees of this webinar, that's great. Um, to if there are follow-up questions, can we ask that at least for the next seven days you will respond to same if there are questions pertaining to your presentation? Yes, I'm happy to thank do so. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, to everybody, thank you very much for attending this the session. The web, the presentation will be. I think um, there is a way. So, and um, Marianne will explain how you can obtain a copy of this presentation. And if you've got questions, please send them to her directly. She will collate questions them to, to Jody for responding and the next seven days you should be getting an answer. All right. Thank you very much everybody. And uh, so stay safe. Nice. And <laughs> All right. Cheers. Bye bye. Bye. Okay. Recording. Uh, okay, leave.